start now. Hey everybody, hear my voice? Uh, my name is Diane McCormick and I'm a uh, community liaison nurse from the uh, BC Nurse Line and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share this uh, time with uh, Della. I uh, wanted to acknowledge before we go into the presentation, working with the physicians on both sides, it, it really made a difference for us that we could be grounding our work in the uh, medical evidence-based uh, protocol that is in the field. Dr. Uh, Doris Farwich actually sat at the table with us and was introduced, uh, as Della was, uh, to our decision support tool and uh, at the beginning thought, what a laborious position this is. <laughs> but, quite enjoyed the process and uh, was was there with us. And Dr. Brian Winsby uh, received them when we completed the work and went through them and, and signed them off uh, for us. I just wanted to acknowledge them before we go on. Why the telehealth connection with Fraser and the uh, BC Nurse Line? At the BC Nurse Line, we were already receiving uh, palliative calls uh, from families. And uh, as uh, Carolyn stated, the ministry was very interested in taking the next step. How could we support the caller in a more uh, defined way? And looking at Fraser, they were also developing their own strategies for 24-hour uh, access for their, their patients in the community. So uh, at that time, there was a gap in the community. Maybe Della can speak a little bit more to what she saw as a gap in her community. Well, I think one of the things Carolyn mentioned is really of the 13, there's 13 communities in in Fraser Health that are all part of the home care uh, delivery of palliative care. And really only, I think, two of those communities had a call-in connected to a palliative care unit. The other communities, actually after home care nursing was finished, in some places that was four in the afternoon, and other places it may have been 10 o'clock at night, there was no connection. Uh, and as you know, there's also a variety of family physician availability from some physicians that actually have a call group that that takes calls to other places where the message on the phone is if you need support, you know, after hours, go to your nearest emergency department. So when the families called into us, we, we provided the service as usual. We used our uh, assessment skills, our triage, and offered the disposition. So we were looking at this exciting new process of being able to be linked. So uh, what we did was, first of all, identified a line. We have a generic line. For our callers, uh, we have a line uh, coming in from Newborn Hotline, we have a line coming in from BCAS. So we want a designated line, so when the nurses actually receive the call on the call display, it would identify that it was a caller coming in from uh, a registered uh, patient in the palliative services. So the, the patients were enrolled, and this was critical for us to know in order that we could move into the uh, strategies that Dell and I were working for as far as the intervention. The um, phone number was given to the uh, families as each nurse visited, and what our concern was, if uh, they didn't have the number and called in on a generic line, how would we address that? And uh, as Del and I were working through that process, we came up with language the nurses could use in order to make sure that we were talking with, uh, with the family member who was registered in the program. Just to be clear, so that we have a generic nurse line number, the number that our families are given is a different number, right? And uh, so that was that was important for, for us and it's important for the nurse line to know that they actually were talking to families that were part of the palliative care program. So, just to clarify, do you mean that during the day they were asked to call one line and during the evening they were asked to yes. call, call the home care nurse Yeah, so they called their normal home care office during the normal home care hours. So this so we'll just, that's a good question to raise. During the day, as Della just said, they, they will be talking to their home care nurse, and then there's an after hours service up until nine o'clock right across Fraser Health. And after nine o'clock to eight o'clock in the morning, we were providing the service uh, for, the, for the families and their patients. And when they, they did call in, we were using the, the call flow that we will be speaking to and uh, triaging the call and providing the symptom support and any information that the caller uh, was asking for, and if it indicated with the outcome of our uh, triage, the dispositions indicated to transfer to the palliative response nurse. The uh, <clears throat> families had that opportunity to speak directly to someone after they spoke with us, 
and when we completed the the call, we faxed the uh, contact notes and the demographics over to that designated fax number, and then it was sent out across uh, Fraser uh, the next morning. So it was available for the nurses upon their arrival uh, at work. The uh, importance here was that the nurses uh, would absolutely know when they arrived that they would have the information that occurred during the night. And as well, over in Fraser, you could speak a little bit about the PRN nurses in the community. So um, we'll talk a little bit more, but we established nurses on call to receive the uh, telephone transfer from the BC nurse line. So this was new for us, and we can talk maybe later about the challenges in establishing that, but established um, nurses that were able to take that call from the BC nurse line. And those nurses, so we actually have one nurse on call for all of Fraser Health between 9 at night and 8 in the morning. And we soon discovered that that person needed to have more specialized hospice palliative care skills than a generalist. So the BC nurse line is the generalist based knowledge frame. And then if knowledge uh, a care is needed, with more specialized knowledge than it comes to us, and then therefore we have to have nurses <laughs> answering the phone that have that skill. And we have uh, our palliative care physicians already were on call uh, for other aspects of our program. So they are there to back up the nurses that we call the palliative response nurse or PRN, and clinical nurse specialists are also on call to back up the palliative response nurse. Um, when calls are come to the, the palliative response nurse, then that documentation, there's a process of that documentation going forward to the appropriate home care office, as well as a message, so that the home care nurses the next morning know what it is that they need to do to respond. And that was well accepted by home care, because that already is the practice. If, if it wouldn't have been us leaving the message, there would have been a pac patient message on the phone, right, for them in the morning of, I'm not managing, my pain's out of control, you need to give me a call back this morning. So it wasn't, this is not an increased load on the home care nursing practice because they would have already had those messages from families. Just to speak to that, um, is it, it was a new behavior for us at the nurse line. Uh, the uh, first time that we have actually linked out into the community and sent information across, so we had to be very uh, careful that where we were sending the information was a secured site. And so we did a little work around, around that and the nurse completes her work, takes uh, the work to our shift leader, the shift leader then faxes the information. So that was a new step for us. Yes? Just, just want to make an observation for this in case the people stay online for us. One, uh, this is not a possible thing to do unless you have an organized palliative care situation in the regional health and, and because it, you can't be talking about the depth of coverage with the backup of nurses, et cetera. You can't, you can't just go into a place and say, we're going to have a call line, it's going to be in, I'll uh, just pick our own province, we're going to uh, Quinnell. And maybe, and I think maybe what will be helpful is if we do the whole presentation, and then because I think that there are, just like anything, you can have the whole meal deal, and then there's different aspects that actually are quite applicable in an area. Not that each area doesn't have to have some capacity on their side, but I think if we go through and kind of give you the full range of, of what the service was, and then when we have the opportunity to talk afterwards, I think there is lots of applicability that may not look exactly this way. So, uh, Because they're known to us by, as I said earlier, the uh, two, two states that we use that came across our uh, phone display, as well as identifying that they were registered in the uh, Fraser Palliative Service, we could deviate from our usual call process. And we were using an enhanced call process and we were using the uh, hospice palliative care protocols that we'll be speaking about. As well as when, when Del and I sat down and took a look at the decision-making tool, and our, our particular brand is called HealthWise um, Knowledge Base, we wanted to make sure that we were working within the within our defined parameters, within the uh, parameters of the hospice as well, work as well as looking at being able to uh, reinforce the, the plan that's in the home. 
for example, you know, reinforcing the current medication plan the individual had, as well as uh, deviating from any plan that was present, we would have to be moving on to the specialist. So that was the uh, step that we had to be taking. If you could take out the call flow and, and take a look at it, 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 it certainly is a work of art. <laughs> and I uh, would like to say that a lot of thought went into this in order to design it. So the nurse, when she's opening up the call, she or he is opening up the call, is able to determine, uh, are you part of a registered program and are you in the Fraser uh, Paladin program? We also are very uh, in need of knowing what has your doctor or nurse told you about your current state? That's very critical. So we can start our, our assessment. We want to determine if it's a new or expected symptom. And this was, this was a critical point that we had to address. Because there are symptoms that are not anticipated. And uh, we wanted to be able to, to hear that in our uh, assessment in order to follow the, the protocol in an appropriate way. With the expected symptom, uh, Della was able to bring the questions that are used in practice to us. And we were able to incorporate that into our assessment. And you can see there well thought of questions. It brings a lot of information uh, for us. And as you see, as we're moving down, we want to uh, be definitely sure what state the person is. Uh, and this is the area that um, we've been doing quite a bit of support work with the nurses if the person's in the last days of life. We wanted to be able to support the family with their decisions that they had made. So uh, these questions are, are critical to uh, ask and to uh, be able to follow through the protocols. So if it's an expected symptom, we wanted to know if there was an uh, assigned DNR in order to address the wishes of the family and not to put them in a position of compromise and uh, send them on for care that wasn't appropriate. So that uh, was another critical point to look at and also to be able to address the fact that with our triage outcomes in each uh, nurse line will have a uh, different language, but we have an immediate care which is 911. The uh, red zone we address as immediately seeing a physician. Yellow zone is seeing a physician uh, within the next uh, 12 hours. Green and black is seeing a physician <coughs> or healthcare professional within 48 hours up to one week. So as we changed uh, the protocols, we were able to direct the caller uh, to the next level of care, which was the PRN nurse. And when you look at the, the flow, we wanted to to indicate that if it was a, a 911, we were addressing it appropriately and we could direct the family uh, to go uh, for care. Yes? So did you just say that they had to have seen a physician within? No, that's what the, that's what the disposition means. Oh, disposition. Just, okay. so, just so we had you know, time frames uh, yeah, to work from. At any point in time, we wanted to be able to offer to the caller if they needed more reassurance and that we were able to offer as nurses that they had the next stage, which was again a transfer across to the, to the PRN nurse. So if you look at the call flow, uh, we have the uh, direction whether it's a yes or a no and, and moving down. And the critical part that I was very, very pleased about was the fact if it presented with our triage at 911, we were able, with the signed DNR, to transfer that caller over to the to the palliative response nurse, and that family was supported because they did not want to have to travel out and go to a, a hospital for care un, unless the uh, outcome uh, was determined by the, the palliative response for nurse. For those folks that aren't telehealth people, I think <laughs> I just see it jumping here a little bit yeah. because. Um, one of the huge learnings for me, I mean, this was so exciting actually to learn all about telehealth because I realized they had not a clue, um, was the notion that what you're seeing in relation to the call flow is augmenting a rigorous system that is that the nurses are versed in in relation to going through and assessing what is the caller's need, doing a symptom assessment if that's what what it's related to a symptom going through the protocols asking a number of questions which then by uh, which then trigger for the nurse let's say and we'll, we'll show you in our case studies but let's say I'm vomiting blood I'm vomiting okay you're vomiting now are you vomiting blood okay well when you get to are you vomiting blood the triage actually stops within the health nurse they've identified something that would be a 911 type of call right 
So normally, if you didn't have related to palliative care, they would have to stop at that point and say, because you're vomiting blood, what I would advise you to do, what needs to happen is you should be going directly to your emergency department. I can call an ambulance for you. You can call an ambulance. Which way would you like to get there? So it stops because the highest level of care needs to kick in. So you can imagine for our palliative patients, if if that was my breath, you know, my husband's breathing has changed. He's he's you know having gasping respirations or whatever. If they just went into triage the symptom, all of our people are going to be 911 calls in palliative care, right? So it, it was beyond looking at what is the content, which is actually very sound in all these nurse lines. I mean, this is their business. They know how to triage and ask way beyond um, rigor that most of us are used to. Um, so this is why the flow of the call and the changing disposition is an integral piece to this project because um, when that 911, when it was identified as a 911, then the nurse is able to, the nurse is able to ask some questions around the enhanced assessment, what can you tell me what you, uh, about your husband's activity right now, is he spending most of his time in bed, has that changed within the last few days, which is a gentle lead into when they say yes, you know, what, your, what have you been told to expect? A, a gentle lead into, is this the last days and hours of someone's life? Do you think that your husband may be close to death? Yes, they've told us that it could be at any time or whatever. All right, so the, do you, is your, you know, do you wish to have your husband die at home? Is that the plan? All, all conversation that we're very comfortable with in palliative care, but is not comfortable conversation necessarily in the nurse line, so that, so that the um, triage codes are embedded in the context of the palliative care situation. And therefore, even though it may be that this person is vomiting blood and there, there does need to be immediate attention, that immediate attention is coming from us, or if it is a change that is a normal expected part of end of life, like a change in respirations, we the nurses are actually able to not triage the symptom and uh, ask about that and to go into an end of life area. So, but the processes that the nurse uses within the nurse line is a comfortable, comfortable, normal processes. The dispositions and what they do with it's 911 or he needs to be seen immediately is embedded within the context of palliative care. So, is that? I think that's really, uh, really valuable. You explained it because it's become part of me. <laughs> And I, I certainly appreciate the fact of how I felt when I first came to the to the nurse line, and, and I was learning <laughs> what all this meant. So thanks, thanks so much. I appreciate that. What we what we have are, are two uh, types of calls come in, but uh, or three types of calls. But primarily, the calls that are coming from the palliative uh, caller is a symptom call. Something has changed at home, and Della uh, certainly brought out the. The reality to me of how well the families are managing and coping at home. So when they call us, they have used all of their resources, and we are really a, an integral part of uh, of their world at, at that particular time of, of the day. So what we want to do is strive to to identify whether it's a new symptom or an expected or a previous symptom. This has created a bit of a challenge because uh, I don't know how you have felt, but sometimes when we've been given a lot of information and we go away, we don't remember all the things that are, are actually going to happen to us. And to some folks it might have been a new symptom, but actually uh, it is part of the process uh, of their life at, at that time. So the nurses are, are using those two parameters in order to go into the symptom assessment appropriately. When it isn't a previous or expected symptom, we go into the enhanced, and as Della indicated, there are excellent questions that gently bring out the information and they're great triggers, and we get more information uh, from the, the caller. If it's a new symptom, we, we use our decision support tool uh, as, as business as usual. And what I'm picking up with uh, the nurses, uh, they're using the enhanced assessment as well because it's giving them more information just to get a picture to, to find out uh, what is happening. And as Della just spoke to, these are, are indications of some of the questions that uh, are in the enhanced assessment, just to let you know how we determine uh, 
when the nurse would be ro moving into this role, we set criteria around um, the enhanced assessment stage as far as advanced education for the nurse needing to be with us for six months. It's, it's a major transition coming into a nurse line, grounding her himself into these new strategies, becoming very comfortable in the field, then moving on uh, with uh, enhanced assessments. And we have a three-hour workshop, which Dello came over and was part of it. And we're increasing it to four hours because we recognize we needed more experiential uh, time at the end of, of the workshop. So these are the questions that we're using. Can you tell me about your family or, your, or yourself? Very unusual to hear from a fa uh, the actual patient. More often, the family is calling. Um, are they spending more time in bed? Gives us a real picture of what's going on uh, with, with what's going on in the home. And also, what is their perception of, of the changes that have happened in the last few days? This last question has created some challenges around how do we actually approach this question. And what we're using now is your language in the last hours uh, of life, or last days, because we're not sure uh, last hours, last days, and uh, rather than being very pointed about, do you think your family member is uh, coming close to death? That, that created some challenges for our nurses to speak to. Also, we want to hear the wishes of the family member, and did they want to be at home? Because some folks didn't recognize that the, a, a signed DNR had occurred. <laughs> So when we said it in this way, oh yeah, we've got this form here, and uh, that made a, a difference for us. So this is indicating uh, if there has been assigned uh, DNR. And we do not want to triage if the individual has uh, signed uh, a DNR. Our knowledge base is loaded with excellent information at the end of uh, life, and we have a dying process. So we can confirm with the family you may, might not have recalled, but this is some of the symptoms that could be appearing for you. Let's just talk about them, especially around respiratory, especially around uh, being lucid. So uh, the, as they hear it, then it becomes a trigger for them to recognize. If they need more reassurance than what we're able to provide, we're able to transfer across to the, to the PRN. Just system. one thing I would mention there. One of, one of the reasons that this was important to actually identify when uh, families are describing what's going on, if this is potentially an end of life, uh, last last days, uh, hours. The reason that we had the, the change so the nurse line didn't go through the normal triage is because of the anxiety provoking. Are you know? Are your you know? Do you have any? Does he have any pain in his shoulder? Is there? There's you know? Is he? You know? All these all these questions that are that are anxiety provoking to ask them. So what we're trying to do is to normalize that this is a natural part of the process of an expected death. But if you start going into all of these blah, 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 then you're actually creating this, instead of reassuring, you're building anxiety. So this actually was a, a, an important deviation in the normal call flow for their population. But I think this also creates anxiety on the nurse line side because that's not a, that's not a usual uh, pattern of practice. What we uh, have is uh, a web that we can base information and load it on our, our decision support tool. And this was uh, an awesome tool uh, brought to me by one of the folks in IT. And I thought, isn't this great? We can load everything what, that we need the nurses to have. and. Uh, in, have the information available. So what we've done is, as you can see, it's in your package. We developed an FAQ, and that has made a difference too, uh, because there are some questions that, that are commonly asked, and, and if we have the answers, we can just flow it into, uh, into our call. We also wanted to have the detail present uh, of, of how to do all of the operational sites. So we wanted that loaded. We also wanted to have all the home care numbers. So if someone calls and I've just misplaced my home care number, if you have it, we could just bring it up very, very quickly for them and, and have a seamless uh, sense of uh, support to them. And the protocols, which were uh, you know, approved and, uh, as, and based in Fraser, we wanted to load them in order to supplement our, our, our knowledge base. So one of the examples, I think, was around uh, the uh, sub-Q IVs. So this is an example of the uh, FAQs. You can see the, the questions. Uh, that we've asked and we have all the answers and and what we're doing one, is one of the things around that so they're frequently asked questions that are 
don't naturally fall in a place in the way that the nurse would be gathering information, the nurse from the nurse line, that that uh, information would normally come forward. And often those are questions around medications. So they are generic type of questions rather than related to a body system or a symptom. So we, we needed to look at, and with all the nurse lines, the, their knowledge base or whatever they use is differently. How do you actually embed this information in their natural processes that for those nurses would support their practice? So for, for the BC nurse line, this was one of the ways we needed to do it for their uh, clinical practice. And just to follow up on that, uh, we have had other questions asked, and I contact Della, and she gives us the answers, <laughs> and we load them, so it continues. This is, this is an example of the uh, topics that we were looking at in order to uh, support our knowledge base. And, and it's interesting, Della and I were talking about, this is where we thought a lot of our work was, was going to be, and we did spend hours. Uh, going and hours. Over, and, hours. <laughs> and hours going over this, but what we do is we call these alerts, and so it adds to the, the current text that's in our, our decision support tool. So when the nurses pull it up, they will be able to, to take a look at if the question that's being asked comes around, for example, the person's having a swallowing problem. The directions are right there, which which was uh, very valuable to the nurse. So in the pack, in your package, there's actually the list of snippets of content in relation to in relation to palliative care. And what we would do is, for example, we went through all of the information around diarrhea, for example, and found out that there was nothing that kind of talked about if someone was really constipated and it was actually not diarrhea, um, that, that that's inf fundamental information to us in palliative care, but it wasn't there within their content. So we said, okay, this needs to be an alert. This needs to alert this nurse practicing in telehealth that this is a this is a context specific to palliative care or somebody that's using opioids and so we would embed those little pieces of information which are all from our palliative textbooks and you know in relation to um, many 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 of the areas didn't need to have anything embedded in because the content was was uh, you know very thorough but so the ones that, that Diane has identified out there were things that were, were where there was a gap. So just, again, I don't know if you yeah. that, but where did the original content The original content, the, do you want to talk about how the, how the, the original content? Uh, for the end of life piece. This is a, we have a decision support tool and, it's, and the company brand is HealthWise Connect. So, so at we the end of that. Oh, and at the topic. end of it, there's yeah. actually a uh, life. Uh, documentation around who had reviewed it, who had reviewed the end of life content. Oh, so and actually, there was a Canadian palliative care physician that had reviewed this end of life content that was already part of the of the knowledge base. Um, so, so you didn't have to start. No. no. Um, I just have a question. This is tremendous work, and I'm very fascinated by uh, the symptom management aspect. I um, do some moonlighting at the Cross Cancer Institute, we handle telephone triage for all in northern Alberta. It's always a slippery slope when you have someone with a, a terminal type of cancer and they're being managed by chemotherapy or radiation or symptom management. And many of the protocols we talked about are things that they would experience. We have to, is that, um, is that integrated into your protocol and your assessment? Maybe I can speak to that because that would be more specialized symptom management than what the generalist uh, management from the nurse line would be. So that would come over typically to the palliative um, response nurse. And then there's the question, you know, if they're actively, they have, everybody in, in our health authority has a cancer agency number and a, an ability to link 24 hours to the cancer agency. So we would be able to refer them back there. And I guess, you know, I'm not sure if that's something that the nurse line would do as well. And, it, and actually, it's, it's been a question that uh, we have had during this period of time. Someone was having symptoms and they had been uh, instructed by their oncologist to contact them if these symptoms mm -hmm. appeared. And they needed reassurance from us that it was okay to contact the oncologist. You have been directed and it's okay. And we talked a little bit about the symptoms just, just to make sure there's not an acuity in it. 
that they didn't need to speak uh, quickly to a, a, the PRN nurse, but actually they could call back. And they also, as Della said, they have a 24-hour line. So it's just giving that, yes, it's okay to call because it's this time of day. One of the things, just so, yeah, one, can we maybe because I'm, I'm conscious that we're, we're not able to capture the comments that are coming from the floor in relation to this, maybe what just we should do because it's rich discussion yep. that we need to have is we should move through the cases and then we can get into the meat of the, of the real nitty gritty of the discussion. So this just gives you an example of the alerts and um, we have other alerts for other reasons, public health alerts, so they're, they're color coded and we chose uh, to have purple. So uh, what we did, oh, this is your side. Okay. So from Fraser Health side, we talked already about establishing on-call palliative response nurses. Then when you look at home care practice, I think it's very humbling for all of us that work in home care to realize once you've looked at rigorous telehealth protocols, how abysmal our home care practice is in relation to the amount of work that we do over the phone with a lack of resources for our own staff to use. So then. We had to look at our own call flow process and what we were going to use for decision support and we've developed a whole manual in relation to that for our staff on our side to support them in their decision making. Had to establish communication systems between all the home health offices and we had to have support from our senior executive to say service will be delivered till 9 o'clock in, in the home health offices and we're going to have that consistently across the health authority because we had to have some time to start with the nurse line, it could be anywhere from 4 till 11. Then the last thing that we did was we actually, this was something that we needed to do within part of our program, but this certainly supported the impetus, was created a database of our home health patients that actually our nurse that's on call can, um, can pull up that information about that patient. There's a, uh, a brief amount of information that gives the fundamentals for her to use in practice. So from her home. From her home, yeah. So the findings that, uh, that we and Della have uh, brought forward to you is from January 17th, it's a launch, and uh, we went up until, uh, uh, until May. So we started, started out with approximately 500 potential callers at any one time, and so that was something that we didn't know, how many calls that we would be receiving. We receive approximately 1,000 calls a day at the BC nurse line, so we didn't know how this would be. So we had 75 calls to the BC nurse line. This is just in the first four months. We're yes. still we're still doing this. This is just data from the first, first four months, months up to May 22nd. 42% was managed by the BC nurse line, and 58% we referred across to the uh, Fraser Health Authority uh, palliative response nurse. So it averaged out that 4.2 calls were coming in per week, and uh, we also have arrival times. So we looked at the arrival times of the call and 60% were arriving between eight, uh, uh, 10 o'clock and midnight and uh, 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning. So that was very interesting. So if you want to speak to this. Sure. Uh, so then in looking at the calls that come in, um, Dan and I looked at using the triage. Um, okay, what, what was the triage? So in relation to acute, so the 911 calls, that would have been a 911 type of triage were 9%. And actually, um, there were only two calls that the nurse line has, has sent directly to the emergency related to new symptoms that are acute and, um, uh, and not expected or previous. Um, and then we have, from our side, we've sent four people to emergency when we've done our own triage when the call has come to us. As soon as possible care, that is the red, which is see your physician immediately. Um, those types of calls were 21%. Those are actually coming to the palliative response nurse. The other ones that would see your physician immediately, rather than see your physician immediately, it's talk to the palliative response nurse. So those really acute calls are about 30% of the calls, which is quite high when you imagine the acuity that families are managing at home. The next group, care within 12 hours, um, was 13% of the calls and, and just 3% means you need to be seen within the next day. That 16% of the calls are calls that potentially the nurse line can manage independently because they're connected with home care. The home, they, we can get home care nursing to follow up the next day. So potentially those are 16% of calls that, that are more targeted for the nurse line to manage independently. 
the home treatment, that's where these are, it's beyond a day and the nurse line is really reinforcing the existing treatment plan and providing reassurance and doing what nurse lines do very well. And the, the last 28% were those folks that were identified that they were in their last hours, days of life. And um, so those are the ones where we said they didn't have to triage the symptom call. You could provide support from the, from the uh, information within their knowledge base about end of life. And then 10% of those, of those um, so 18% were last days, and 10% were people where a family member had died, and, the, and they were calling for support. And we're just going to kind of talk about, just kind of going to work through a, uh, a, a few examples here. So here's a fellow with pancreatic cancer who has phoned the nurse line vomiting some brownish blood on the pillow. Um, more pain, pain more severe, increased weakness. It is a new symptom. He does not have, so as the nurse has gone through her assessment, he does not have to assign DNR. So the triage would normally be 911, and it was left as that. The friend's going to take them to emergency, they didn't want an ambulance. It was really important that we weren't setting up a system that was going to give somebody worse care <laughs> because they had a palliative diagnosis. So that, because who knows what might develop for, it, for any of these folks along the way that is an acute symptom that should be uh, treated appropriately in an emergency. And this is, this is exactly an example of that. So that never was transferred to us because he appropriately needed to go and see. Now this is a man with thyroid cancer with lung mats who had multiple things going on. So new symptoms um, in relation to that his uh, feet, he was saying his big toes on both feet were blue, his feet were cold, his fingers were cold, um, family calling for him. There was a sign, DNR in the home. The goal was for home death. The disposition given the changes would have normally been given DBT and FRAC a 911 call. But in, so this is a new symptom, but a person with a, a DNR, Goal to die at home, so that comes to the PRN given our call flow. So the the palliative response nurse phones the family. They don't want intervention. They don't want any investigations. They do not want to go to the hospital again. It's able to call up the basic information that she's got there, do some further assessment and stuff, provide reassurance and anticipatory guidance, and have a home care nursing visit the next morning in 24 hours. For our first calls, for the first eight months, we have followed up in 24 hours to find out where these folks are, and this person was at home. So now this is a red call. This would be seeing your physician as soon as possible in the normal triage. Woman with severe abdominal pain, unrelieved with passing gas and bowel movement, which I guess right away is a put critical, put <laughs> critical indicator yeah. for their slide. They know that, that this, um, a uh, woman ha is using a dirigitic patch and uh, as needed morphine, she's already taken a breakthrough, it's provided a little relief. Able to get out, out of bed and go to the bathroom even though she's weak, she's nauseated, she's taken some gravel. They have, um, there is no um, DNR sign, but what can I do for abdominal pain? This is already an expected symptom. Um, so she needs care as soon as possible. This would have normally been go the middle of the night where she's going to get care as soon as possible, emergency department. Um, so that was transferred to the PRN. And so the nurse, you can go to the next one. Okay. So the nurse is able to view the information, do a more complete assessment now, determine what's your level of breakthrough, what's the size of your patch, and then make a decision around, so the nurse, take another breakthrough now. The, the breakthrough dose was quite low compared to the basic ongoing analgesic dose. Stayed on the phone with that family, uh, providing reassurance. Um, the nausea actually improved with the pain reduction. She'd already taken some gravel. Reinforcement of you can take your breakthrough every hour as needed. There was a plan there. Um, wrote the thing up, faxed it off to the home care nurses, left them a message. The person uh, stayed home and was home a day later versus directly see your doctor immediately, which at night is going to be emergency room visit, if they choose to do that or else just be stressed out during the night.
Here is an example of communication to the hospital palliative care team. Do you want to talk about this one? Yes, this is uh, the the yellow indicates that the care is uh, is advised within the next 12 hours. So that was our protocol to transfer across uh, to the PRN or to the uh, home care office with fax documentation. This person uh, was a woman with breast cancer. The aunt was calling, and she was having uh, trouble passing uh, urine and. Looking at, at, at the uh, information here, you see there was frequency with little urine produced. There, there was no fever, there was no pain. And she was in hospital with similar symptoms uh, and had a fuller removed, but came home last week and there wasn't any problems. She was up and around. The assumption by being up and around we made that she wasn't in the last days of life. So our disposition was to see her doctor within the next 12 hours. So what we would do is go into our home treatment and support uh, the care for the next 12 hours before she goes to see her physician, which is increased uh, fluids, giving her information, and also a symptom disclaimer if symptoms change, and we would give her the symptoms to watch for, call back, and we'll reassess them. And then we put together our documentation and faxed over to the home care office, and then it was available uh, the next morning for the nurse to be in touch with. So even though there was no direct connection with the, with the uh, Response nurse. The benefit for for this lady from being connected with this is, as home care, we know that she's having some problems, right? She might not have phoned. We might not have known anything about that. So we're actually able to do the follow up. And the benefit I I see here is the reassurance and the ability to have a restful night. And uh, make, uh, make so here is an example of a symptom in the last days of life of the lady with late stage breast cancer with metastases. They have a DNR in place. She's been vomiting once a day for the last week. Her physician's aware of that. She has a medication plan. Home care nurse is visiting or calling daily. So the BC nurse line knows that information. She vomited 15 minutes after taking a gravel, so she wants to know if she can take a gravel suppository. So because the disposition, they don't have to triage the symptom, right? Because they know that um, uh, this is someone that appears to be in their last days of life or certainly with extensive disease. So they're able to go to that frequently asked questions thing and actually in there what we were able to provide is if you vomited a tablet within taking 15 minutes of taking a tablet you could repeat it. So for this person the caller um, needed further reassurance. So they actually did transfer to the palliative response nurse. Now somebody else might have been quite comfortable with, okay that's I can you know, have my gravel suppository. In relation to the transfer to the pharmacy line would not have been an option uh, because they don't provide direction around that. You know, we vomited our medication, what do we do? Uh, and BC nurse line would not have been able to tell that person, yes, you can take your gravel suppository because this is within 15 minutes of vomiting your tab. They wouldn't have been able to provide that direction. So we basically talked to the family and provide, you know, said yes, have the suppository, but if you look at the level of acuity that was happening in that home, this is very appropriate that further reassurance was provided, right? So if you kind of just look at, at what was going on for that person. And this is, this is an example um, in relation to a medication question. So someone who's uh, taking methadone uh, by rectal route and no longer swallowing definitely in the last days of life. The wife wakes up in the middle of the night, thinks it's six o'clock in the morning, and gives his six o'clock dose at one o'clock. So what do I do now? And so for the BC nurse line, there's no frequently asked question. There's nothing that they can use to problem solve that. So it was pretty clear that, that they needed to transfer. And so, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, if, if that question had come in in our regular service, we would have been transferring across to DPIP, uh, which is the poison control line, which then, you know, would give the information. And so it would be a different set of uh, pieces of information as compared to the palliative nurse. So it's just awesome that we had the opportunity to transfer across and reassure uh, the family. So, you know, so the nurse is reassuring, first of all, to say, that's okay that you did that. This person's not going to be harmed from it. Knowing as well that this appears to be somebody in their last hours of life that potentially this man could die during the night and the wife's going to think that she, you know, that it was related to the, so to be able to reassure her that, um, that if, if 
her husband died during the night to know it wasn't really related to that extra dosing of medication, that he'd been on this for a while, it was very stable, not to worry, to hold the six o'clock dose, wait for the home care nurse to phone in the morning, and give the PRN methadone if they felt that he was still having pain. Then the uh, poly response nurse was able to call our palliative physicians on call, or called mocap physicians, who then reinforced, yep, yeah, that's, that's what should happen, reduce PRN dosing until the, the two o'clock dose and resume that dose. So you had physician support as well to back up the palliative response nurse in relation to her decision making. And then the last group that we're going to talk about are death at home. We, there's multiple calls in relation to this, but we just, my wife just died, we have a signed DNR, what should I do? And there is an alert that Diane will show you um, that is the, the information that the nurse can provide. But seven, five of the seven calls in the first four months at the time of death were uh, transferred to the palliative response nurse, even though there was the information there to give for reassurance. Um, and what Diane was telling me last night is she's noticing that more and more of those calls, the nurses actually are reassured themselves so they can provide reassurance that this is actually okay to, um, and so all of the calls avoided a 911 call and an ambulance call. And this is just gives you an example of the kind of information that the nurses have at the nurse line to be able to, um, to be able to talk to families from, and to be able to kind of reinforce to them that it's, it's okay, that they don't need to do anything now, it's um, to have the body removed from the home, that this is a privileged time to just call some other family members to be with them and that the home care nurse would call in the morning. And uh, But always there is the, the support to the nurse line. I think actually that's one of the things by having a program that they can hand off to, it, re, it enables the nurses at the nurse line to be more reassured too. So that if their reassurance doesn't do the trick that they can pass along to somebody else. Oh, that's right. The last um, Velda had shared a case with us of, the, of a multiple call, a person who called multiple times. And um, what we did with that was we talked, we just looked at each of the calls. Do you want to speak to this one, Diane, or should I? I, I I'd like to speak sure. to it, and you can as sure. well. When I was looking over the information. Um, I, w I was quite impacted by the fact that we had someone that was calling frequently and also um, had uh, a multitude of diagnoses besides the current palliative state that, that she was in. And that is very uh, critical to recognize that it's just not all palliative, like they have a world before <laughs> they became palliative. So what uh, the first call was, was looking at sharp stabbing, chest pain, and with the triage it would have indicated an ambulance transfer. And, here, with, with the, the, the protocols established as we have, we can transfer the call over to the PRN nurse and assess, is it actually from, from where the site of the cancer is, a, is metastasizing or is it actually you know, a coronary event? Suicide ideation with medications, we talked a lot about that as far as how would we support an individual who is at that point in, in their own uh, decision. Again, our triage would, would have indicated, as it indicates here, it is a transfer across to uh, <clears throat> the emergency by ambulance. Here we would be transferring across to the PRN nurse. In order to discuss this more and find how can we support you when you're at this particular state of uh, having suicide ideation. No pain medications left and no prescription. Uh, there is no recommendation in the middle of the night, what, what do you do uh, uh, with that? Um, what we have uh, is a transfer across to the after hours uh, PRN nurse as well as the fact that if they had a prescription, I was saying to Della, she even gave us the 24 hour numbers that's available in Fraser that a family member could go to and pick up the medications. Seizure, this was a new symptom, absolutely would be listening uh, for that. Remember we had the two streams, new and expected, new symptom, we would triage um, as we uh, always and it would be a transfer to emergency room by ambulance. So it was the same as this particular case. Multiple calls for pain. Um, the word that we're using at our site is called a complex caller. And uh, when we have uh, the criteria set for a complex caller, we, we move into a care plan that uh, I, I'm part of that team in, in design. And here, 
we decided if someone calls us more than twice, we're going to flag that. And, and I would let Della know that something is occurring out in the community that the nurse might be missing or it's not discussed at the visit and how she or he could look at that particular case and uh, expand it. And then we would have a care plan in place in order to support that family when, when they called in. So to try to provide that seamless service uh, that we want to provide us afterwards. Is there anything else? No. Before you go on, I'd just like to ask, uh, if you went back to that slide for a second. Yes. With your complex callers, those, those that you have seen so far, mm -hmm. uh, have you had some total pain syndromes there? Is that part of what's going on here, like some existential components to that? Too? Well, I guess with all palliative patients, you have multiple things going on and reasons for calling. And we have had uh, situations where we've had some callers that have called more than more than once or more than twice, mm -hmm. and where you actually need to go back and make sure that 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 we have a comprehensive plan in relation to their care. So I guess the calls to the nurse line mirror calls within the palliative care community. So. Beyond, so yeah. Get covered off in their, sort of their regular. Sure, because time. if you look at what is the purpose for the call at night, the purpose of the call at night is to support this family through the night. We're not, they're not taking over case management. They're not, it is to support the, the mm -hmm. family through the night. And so many of these deep complex issues, that's not the role of the nurse line to sort that through. But the nurse line is a phenomenal partner to be able to to uh, provide that information and actually then to be able to even if we need to create a care plan together with the nurse line so that when they get that call again that we've got a common plan for it and that's not very many no. families I mean as I'm sending out this information now the home care nurses to say gosh you guys are doing a tremendous job we've got five 500 potential callers at a time that could call a night we're getting five calls a week you guys are doing an awesome job of supporting guiding anticipating you know, um, that's that is the foundation of the palliative care practice. Thank you for adding that piece to it. So last thing are lessons learned for I talk about the nurse line piece. Yes. <laughs> the uh, the initial component of lessons learned, this is a very different call. Uh, for, for the telehealth nurse to receive. And uh, if anybody's had the opportunity to be in a telehealth office, the calls are coming one after another. And they are moving through uh, many, many different symptoms. And then all of a sudden, this call drops in. And uh, for example, it, it could be, my, my wife just died. Well, you know, just having that call come in, you, you, you want to be very grounded to support and be uh, there for the caller. And it, it, it did change uh, the nurse's viewpoint of, of the calls coming in and how do we support each other in that. The other is looking, and I'd like to speak to more uh, of that area later, the other is the number of calls we receive a day. Um, as it indicates here, there's 900. There can be up to 1,000. We do know it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday are our heavy calls. And with one call, um, the nurses were, were challenged with building their confidence and their experience uh, with, the, with the call. And all of us as nurses have learned to feel more confidence in, as we have been able to build our, our practice with repetitive activity. So this became uh, a challenge for us to support the nurses. Certainly was reinforcing uh, with the nurses that there was opportunity for debriefing. When you finish the call, the shift leader is right there to debrief you. If you need more debriefing, our team managers are available. If there's more debriefing, uh, I was available. And I made a point of, of contacting each nurse uh, with their first call and their second call. And I had a set of questions that I was asking in order to find out, did these calls trigger any uh, emotions that they weren't prepared to have triggered that particular day coming to work? Um, you don't know what you're carrying until something opens that up and wanted to have the opportunity uh, for reflection and also wanted to have the opportunity to be there at a later time if with reflection two, three days down the road this call disturbed uh, the nurse. The other side of that was the nurses were unsure how valuable they were to the uh, palliative family and were they actually able 
to make a difference for this family. And as Del is saying, this is a, a huge part uh, of what I like to do is go back out and show value and, and by giving the statistics, but just sitting down and looking at the cases that we're managing. The other area that we um, looked at was actually the operational side. Uh, the call flow sheet that you have in front of you um, we thought it was a great design, and with with user feedback, we have found that it just looks too much at the time of the call. And so, trying to uh, address that, we've decided with the work that we just completed with this presentation, we're going to have four sheets. We're going to have a new new symptom sheet, an expected symptoms uh, sheet, last uh, days of life sheet, and death at home sheet. So as I'm sitting there listening to the call, I'll quickly open the right sheet, and then I'll follow. Uh, the, the call flow. And this was definite feedback from the users and so we're putting those together right now. I'm going to take it out and test it with the nurses and uh, see how we make out. We also have online resources. Uh, learning in time is very valuable for us in order to go and start the call. So we presented the workshop. It was videoed so the nurses have the opportunity to watch it whenever they want. But as time moved away from that initial workshop, their confidence was not there in order to take that first call, which could it be in March or it could be yesterday. So what we heard from the nurses was, how could we have a quick refresher? And um, the education department created an online resource. We want to make sure it's appropriate in our timing of how to uh, use it. So it's 15 minutes. Uh, the nurses can find 15 minutes uh, designated time when they check with their shift leader and go through it again. Or there might be one particular area they want to, to reinforce. One of the questions that uh, came through uh, was how do we deal with pain crisis? And uh, listening with the assessment that the family is following the medication plan, uh, right to the letter, the person still is is definitely in crisis with pain. It's not working. We have, we have decided that we're going to just transfer directly across to the peer nurse because that's who can make a difference uh, for this individual. And I guess the last area of lessons learned is, is recognizing the different um, approaches to palliative each of us come uh, to uh, as a nurse and, and bringing uh, the telehealth nurse up to this level of uh, realizing that she's able to, he or she is able to use their nursing practice skills and to move into an area that makes uh, a major difference to uh, a family at, uh, in between the services uh, with their home care nurse and, and their physician. So that, that is a, a major lesson that we're, we're starting to the challenge, is, the challenge of trying to create one system across Fraser Health, which is our ongoing challenge probably for almost anything, but that we actually, and not knowing what our volume would be, um, and actually being able to come to have one nurse um, to provide that resource. Visits, we're not requiring that the nurse visit who's taking the call. She makes a judgment on if she feels that she could have the have the tools that, that would support that family if she was able to go visit. We've just had two visits of the 43 calls. Um, and if those nurses weren't able to go out with those calls, one was a block catheter, another one was someone who died at home, then she would have problem solved another way with that family. Um, challenge, it's a challenge to uh, incorporate the on-call efficiently uh, within, the, within our Fraser Health, and it took us a while to figure out what would be our model, and we finally come to where we have hospice palliative care, clinical resource nurses that are part of the home care, part of the palliative care teams and geographically, and those nurses were hired to also do on call. So we finally, and it created capacity within the rest of our model, which was a win-win. Um, just the challenge to get everybody to acknowledge that they needed to have service into the evening, but we did accomplish that. Um, for their regular home care hours. And then areas of improvement probably for us are those patients where we have sent them to emergency. We would like to not send them to emergency. We would like to be able to admit them to a hospice palliative care area, either a hospice or a tertiary unit. So we're going to be looking at that. We're also looking at how to increase the consultation role of the, of the palliative care physicians that are on call. And we made a decision that if a family, if a patient <coughs> was going to be transferred, to emergency from the palliative response side that we would call the palliative care physician and provide a consultation at that time because it may be that there's something else that the physician may be able to do 
in relation to that family or even in relation to capacity when the person goes to emergency. So that's and it's just one more area, as I, as I was listing, of areas of improvement that we're going to be moving into, is uh, following the lead of the nurses and listening to what's <coughs> coming back to us in the surveys. Also, we're going to have focus groups and have the opportunity to do some mindful work with the nurses in, the, in this field, as well as start building uh, their capacity and, and moving through uh, areas that we can in palliative care in order to uh, move a little bit in, into a, an area of comfort as each nurse uh, takes the call. So definitely going to follow the lead of the nurses now because this is with us and we want to support the caller uh, the best that we can. Thank you. Well, your yeah. to the questions, could you maybe restate them a little bit so it gets picked up on the microphone? 